Happy Canada Day, everybody. I think a good way to enjoy the day would be to build a kit. And I've got lots of them in here. But I think... Oh, that one's got lots of LEDs. Let's do that one. But first, the beer du jour is Sasquatch Stout from Old Yale Brewing Company in Chilliwack, B.C. Contains coffee, chocolate, and mystery. Perfect! Oh yeah, this... So about this kit. Let's dump her out and see what this one is. Ah, this is the LED hourglass kit. Okay, cool. Seems to be mostly a whole bunch of LEDs. One chip. A switch, power in. Um, another switch. And an ISP header. Interesting. So there's not much other than a whole bunch of soldering going on. There's the chip and its socket. Um, uh oh, I've already put one LED on the floor. I'll get that in a second. Now here is the schematic of the piece such as it is and some Chinese instructions. So basically we have a whole bunch of LEDs um, in clusters. Hang on, I'm going to see if I can find a bigger, less creased version of this. I'll be right back. Okay, that's a little bit easier to read. Um, so we have six clusters of LEDs. Um, half of them wired one direction, half of them wired the other direction. Um, and... So what is that? Uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 57 LEDs. Oh yeah, it says L57 right there. Okay. Uh, but we have a 16-pin chip controlling them. Interesting, which means there's some trickery going on. And you can sort of see it up here. Um, the common side of these clusters of reversed LEDs each goes to a single pin. Pin 10, 11, 14, 12, 13, 15. Why couldn't we have laid them out? Whatever. And then the individual sides, pin 30, 31, 33, 36, 37. And then for the opposite of polarity, again, repeats 30, 31, 33, 36, 37. So, it's essentially a matrix. And let me show you how that sort of works here. Um, I don't know, can you see that properly? Uh, you can zoom in if you want to. Um, well, maybe I'll zoom in a little bit. But... So, here I've got the the pins set up as columns and rows. It's essentially a matrix. And we have two LEDs at each junction, one facing each way. So you put pin 30 high and pin 10 low. And that LED lights. You put pin 10 low and 30 high and that LED lights. No. High, low, that way. I well that way and the same thing just repeats at each junction except for a couple of them uh, um, there's three possible positions that aren't populated so that's how we get actually you could drive up the 60 LEDs but with this using uh, one two three four five six seven eight nine ten eleven pins cute so it's essentially an led matrix now then the chip is an stc 15 w something something it's a microcontroller so the patterns that we're seeing that we will see generated on these leds are essentially coming out of this microcontroller they're pre-programmed though there is an isp header populated on there so if you have the STC programming tools, you could reprogram it, I suppose. Optionally, you could wire those 11 positions out to something more Arduino-like. And you could reprogram it in that language if you're more comfortable in it, like I am. I don't think I'll do that. But the fact that the chip has a socket means that it's easier to modify later in the future. 
So realistically, all this kit needs is a whole bunch of soldering of LEDs and a few other things, which is just perfect for drinking and soldering. So I'm not sure if I explained it super well. Um, I'll just do a quick demonstration here. We've got a couple of LEDs um, put in in opposite directions. Um, one of them, the anode's on this side, the other one, the anode's on this side, they're in parallel. So when we plug in power this away, one of them lights. When we flip the power around, t'other one lights. Um, so that's 90% of what's going on in here. The... Uh, it should be pretty straightforward. The biggest trick I think is going to be getting all the LEDs facing the same direct or facing the correct direction. And in this case, they're all wired with the uh, arrow pointing down, which means the flat side of the LED. Let's zoom in a little bit on this guy here. There's one flat side which corresponds with the short lead. Which corresponds with the bar end of the LED. Oh, and those are blue ones in the kit. Okay. So, these ones all go short LED to the bottom like that. Now then, a decision to be made. Do I want them standing proud from the board or don't I want them sucked right down? I think the easiest way to be to have them standing a little bit proud and you can see there's some shoulders molded in to the LED leads. That's an artifact of the manufacturing process. So I think I will just make use of those. Lock those in place. And repeat. Okay, there I've got a row in there. They're sitting fairly straight. I'll just get one of my favorite vices, besides this, of course, my old Dremel device. You could use any number of things to hold the circuit boards while you're soldering. I happen to like this one because it's got grooves in the jaws which are great for gripping onto the sides of the board. I could use my little claws helping hands or any number of other things, but I've just gotten used to using this thing over the years. And then bring in the soldering iron and a bit of solder. A wipe, a little tin, a little wipe. And I'll get in here. I'm going to solder just one leg of each of these initially. To hold them in place, then I'll flip it over. And just mechanically align them all. And then solder down the other wire, the other lead. Okay, that was pretty quick. Slide that out. That's actually not too bad. Oh, yeah, it is actually. So, just clamp that back in there. Give this guy a bit of a tilt so I can see what's going on. And slip that one down into a bit better alignment. Pull this one up a bit. Pull that one up a bit. Push that one 
down a bit. How's that look? Better that way. Now just straighten them up in a line that way. That one's still a little high. But other than that, they look okay. Uh, that's the middle one. Now this is, these adjustments are not at all functional. This is entirely cosmetic. There we go. And now, let's spin them around and get the other side. There. How's that look? Pretty straight that way, pretty even that way. Not bad. Okay. I'll zoom back out again. Trim off those leads. I'm using flush cutting pliers here as opposed to the more common side cutters. Um, it's a little harder to see on these small ones. But the, do I have a big pair here? I do. So there's a more exaggerated view. So the side cutters, you see this little groove down there. So that when you're cutting, it leaves more of the lead than you're intending. With the flush cutters, it cuts exactly where you wanted it to cut. Making a nice clean cut off. Those leads are probably going everywhere. I'm trying to prevent them from jumping into my beer mostly. Okay. There we go. So the next step is clearly putting more LEDs. Actually I mean, that, putting in more LEDs is just going to repeat over and over and over again. So that's not that interesting to watch. I'll do that off camera, probably, maybe in a montage. Um, next step, to fit the socket in. Its pins have been bent in transit. Because it was just loose in the bag of a hundred other parts. So straighten them out a little bit. There's one side in. There we go. So I'll let that guy sit flush down to the board. And I'll take a couple of pins and just give them a little bit of a bend just to mechanically hold them. Could use blue tack or something like that. Could use tape. Could just hold my finger underneath, which is actually what I might do, just make them nice and tight. Little dab will do you there. Where's another pin over here that's a no, no contact? We'll use that one for the mechanical hold. There we go. Make sure she's happy on this side. Yep. And then just go to town. The beauty of using a socket, other than that you can remove and replace the chip is that when you're soldering, if you're not 100% confident and you're lingering on there too long with the iron, you're not going to overheat the chip and kill it. If you don't have a static grounded workspace or a grounded iron, then you're less likely to damage the chip with static electricity which admittedly isn't as much of a concern as it used to be back in the day. But you always want to be a little bit concerned about static. It can ruin your day. What do we got here? Reasonable. There's the chip. I'll plug the chip in last for 
similar reasons to what I was just talking about. What do we got back here in the pile of components? There's a capacitor. A really tiny little capacitor. Do I see it on the schematic? I do not. What about the schematic that came with the kit? You know it doesn't show it. Okay. Well, let's find it on the board then. I don't see any capacitors. Do you see any capacitors? No. We got the headers, the DC, the switches. Hmm. Let's bring these components forward. And do I want, I don't think I'll put the header on because it really isn't going to affect you. I'm not planning on reprogramming this. Because I, I'm not much of a software guy anyway. And especially I don't have the software tools or the programming interface for working with STC microcontrollers. So there's the main power switch. dig up another chunk of solder soon here. So this power switch has these two mechanical lugs on the outside here to physically hold it in place. They have no electrical connection but boy are they getting hot on the back. And then there's the three electrical connections, only two of which are actually in use. It is a single pole double throw switch, but it's just being used as a single pole single throw. And I'll get a little bit more on that mechanical mounting pad out there. Okay. Okay, that's reasonable. Uh, we have a tactile switch next, which goes like that and again it should just hold itself into the hole because that's why the leads are splayed like that and at the same time let's put on this little DC jack even though I probably will never use it because I don't know that I've got a jack that fits that actually maybe I will put the uh, header pins on. Where'd they go? There we go. And so those guys just fit in there with their spring pressure. And the reason is because the reason I'm using the header pins after all is because it's got grounded VCC on it. So I can use that as a place to uh you know that is going to fall out just like that. Hmm. Where's my Sticky stuff here. There we go. Generic dollar store. It's blue, it's tacky, it's not blue tack brand. I'll just blob that in there. Now that stuff's going to melt a little bit when I heat it up with a soldering iron, but we'll just live with that. Once it cools off, you can peel it off fairly successfully. There's the voltage and ground pins. And just because they're there, TX and RX data. And then let's get this power jack over here. And I might have a power a power wart that'll fit in there. Just not aware of it right now. And I need more solder. Uh, it's left the tech switch. Going diagonally just to spread the heating around. 
I know they can take the heat because they're designed for wave soldering or, re or uh, hot air refill, but I'm just being careful unnecessarily. Okay, so that's basically all the solder in components except for the rest of the LEDs. The rest of the LEDs is going to be incredibly redundant from what you've already seen. So I'm just going to go ahead and do it without too much commentary here. all the LEDs in everything is in except for the chip however I've still got this capacitor which doesn't seem to have a home on the board uh, but it would make sense if it's a microcontroller which it is to have a decoupling capacitor across the power rails as close to the microcontroller as possible so since there isn't an official place for that I'm just going to put it across the two power pins of the microcontroller, which is this heavy track here on pin six, one, two, three, four, five, six, and this heavy track here on pin eight. And I'm just going to just solder it right on like that. A little bit of solder in there. Tack that on. Tack that on. Yes, it is very much a bodge. But there it is. We now have some decoupling around that thing. So, it's all that's left now is to throw the microcontroller in wherever it went. There it is. Handling it gently and respectfully, of course. And I noticed that some of its pins got bent too. There is a tool for this, of course, but this works just fine. It looks fairly straight. So notch that way, notch that way. Just lay in one row of pins along one side. And then just going to squeeze it down in. So now it's not fully seated. It's just holding there. Kind of hovering. Make sure none of the pins are bent. And clamp it home. There we are. Now then, for the next... I guess the next thing to do is just to put some power on it. For that, I'm going to grip it back in my vise, but I'm going to put the rubber jaws on. Why? Because I don't like the idea of metal up against the edge of a live circuit board. Turn the power switch off. I'll get some... I think I need some female pins. And female jumper wires, rather. There we go. Uh, we got VCC over there and ground over there. Okay, I've got my power supply, just out of shot here, I've got it set for 5 volts and just limited to 20 milliamps at the moment. That's what I was doing when I was experimenting with those uh, LEDs earlier. Let's uh, lim ramp the limiting up to about, four, about 500 milliamps. Uh, now, why does that make sense? Um, this thing, according to the descriptions, turns on one row, then another row, then another row, all the way up. So if we say 20 milliamps, 
times. I mean, this is probably going to current limit too, but there's 57 LEDs, right? Um, and even if we run them at 10 milliamps, actually, that's not going to be enough for for that. Let's put this up to about 550, close enough. So the LEDs will be running a little bit lean, but hopefully it won't go up in smoke. So turn that on. There we go. Oh, look at this. That's cool. It worked first try without having to do any messing around at all. So the obviously the scan frequency of that matrix is faster than what the camera would be grumpy about. So that's nice. You can see that a couple of the LEDs are all tweaked over, but whatever. And there we've gone back up. No, what does that do? Let's speed it up. No, let's. Hmm. Interesting. Power switch does nothing. Have I shorted around it? Maybe. Do they all come on at the bottom here? That oh, that one. Okay, that one needs a touch of solder. The rest of them all seem to be okay. So I'll just re-solder that one down on the bottom edge there. Oh yeah, I can see it already. Can you see it? Let's zoom in and see if you can see it. See where my bad solder joint is. That one, this one also looks a little suspect. Touch that one up while I'm at it. A couple up here that also look a little bit dry. They weren't causing me problems, but just visually, when I go back and inspect it. Okay, then why isn't that power switch working? I don't know. Did I short between the pins? Don't think so. Hmm. Is there a track? There's one track coming from... Oh! That's why, because that power switch is connected to this. Okay, there is optionally a USB connector you could put on there to power it. I didn't. So that power switch is just switching from these two inputs. But I'm hot wiring straight onto the board. That's why the power switch isn't working. Okay. So, I'll zoom back out again. And turn on my power supply. Now just watch the LEDs. It looks like a happy thing. I am pleased. Pretty much first try. Only a couple of minor adjustments that I had to make. And it's working. To shut off my soldering iron because I don't need it anymore. Put it up out of the way. I'm going to sit here and watch Das Blinken Lights for a second. Thank you for joining me enjoying my Canada Day at my workbench. If you're Canadian, either in reality or in spirit, cheers! Happy Canada Day to you. Everyone else, thank you for watching. I will talk to you later.